Just... Right, so uh, welcome everyone uh, to our weekly call. Um, as we were just discussing, the last uh, last call of August. Um, as we start to head into the uh, autumn, um, I'll just put up my slides for a moment just to share my screen. Right, so um, this week, as you may have seen from the uh, e email, maybe uh, we don't have a theme for the uh, discussion this week, uh, but I thought I'd just sort of put up a, f a few things that I've, I've sort of noted. Um, uh, from the press, we have a sort of general discussion, and obviously anyone feel free to uh, throw anything else in that you've seen that is uh, sort of reasonably topical uh, currently, um, or, or indeed on your mind. Um, but but I'll, I'll kick off with a, a couple of things uh, which I picked up from social media, which I thought may well. Um, be of interest, which I'd forgotten to put into the uh, weekly headline headlines, or at least in the case of the second one, but I thought, well, they were both uh, reasonable to uh, put up. Uh, so the first, uh, 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 Bert Uber, um, and, until very recently um, of Power DNS, so I know uh, many of you, I'm sure, will will, will know Bert, um, um, who's always doing interesting stuff on, on an amazingly broad range of topics. Um, but uh, for the last sort of couple of weeks, um, he, he's he's been posting about a tool he, he's developed, um, which, uh, as you can see from the uh, description, which I lifted from his tweet, uh, but basically, um, it, it's at the moment limited only to uh, Linux, um, and uh, when it's running, every time your computer sends data to Google, it makes a noise. Um, and if you see the second of the two links um, directly under the text, if you click on that, that will run a short video and you can hear the uh, noise uh, that it makes, which is not terribly uh, exciting. It's almost like uh, a modem noise, um, in, or vaguely reminiscent of that, not quite, um, um, uh, which I think is, is quite a, a, a really simple um, illustration um, of privacy um, or, or lack uh, thereof. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure what motivated him to, to do it, but uh, uh, the code is available, as you can see from the first link um, on GitHub. And I think since this tweet, he's actually sort of um, uh, added a few additional options. I think you can tailor the noise um, and, and a few other things. Um, so he, um, because I think when I, from a tweet uh, of uh, within the last day, his videos had more than a million views, so it's it's it's, it's gone viral. So he's now put a bit more effort into developing the cool, the tool a little. Um, so any anyone that has access to a Linux system and is interested, um, I thought that was worth um, highlighting as a very easy way to bring to life one aspect of privacy. Um, I, I don't know whether he's got any plans to develop it to look beyond Google, but um, uh, um, uh, yeah, I thought it was, it was quite a clever, a clever demonstration tool. Um, so. Uh, if, if you've not had a chance to uh, see that, um, as, as I say, it's well worth watching the short video um, in, in the uh, sec second link just to uh, see it and hear it in action. Um, it should take just sort of 10, 15 seconds um, of your time. Um, and then the second one from Chris uh, um, um, Bouge, is that? I'm not sure how you pronounce Chris's uh, name. One of you on the call may well know. Um, uh, who just posted about uh, uh, a link to an article in Cybersecurity News uh, about um, a, uh, um, a HTTPS um, sort of uh, a DDoS uh, attack, um, which, as you can see, was running at uh, 46 million uh, requests per second. A lot of traffic coming from uh, Tor endpoints. Um, so again, uh, I've not seen anything on that. Uh, um, in, in that sort of subject area recently using HTTPS, but uh, so uh, that just uh, attracted my interest. So I thought I would flag that in case anyone hadn't picked up and um, may find it uh, something worth pursuing. Was there, was there any particular link to Doe in there or was it just, a, it, I just, from what I read, it's just HTTPS 
So is that correct? Yeah, well, that, I, to be fair, uh, John, I, I uh, just reread the article quickly just before this call, and, I, uh, and that was my interpretation. It is HTTPS rather rather than Doe? Um, well, I, I'll, I'll need to read it again slowly uh, after the call, but I I couldn't see the 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 the, the direct Doe link. Um, uh, other than obviously the more stuff that, that's going going that way, uh, yeah, it's, I suppose it's hiding amongst all the other HTTPS traffic, which uh, yeah, potentially makes things problematic. But uh, yeah, I, I couldn't see why he'd particularly highlighted HTTPS, uh, sorry, Doe rather in there. Um, so unless anyone else has read that article already and read it more closely than than I clearly have, um, I didn't think that there, there was a Doe aspect to it. That'll be my homework after the call to to read it again slowly and, and double check. It's, it's not a hugely detailed article, to be fair, but uh, it was mainly focused on sort of countries of origin of some of the uh, traffic um, and uh, where some of the points, as I say, like it was coming from a lot of it from being generated via Tor endpoints and so on. Um, so it's more I couldn't spot the uh, why the Doe reference. Um, okay, so th th those were those two, and then I just put in, in case you hadn't seen them, the uh, some of the, link, the, the the links from the uh, sort of w uh, weekly news headlines that I emailed out earlier today. Um, first one I thought was particularly interesting um, was uh, uh, about iCloud. Uh, sorry, private yeah, relay. Specific. Sorry, Ralph. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that was really next level. I read that and I kind of uh, read my around and I couldn't find where they're doing spoofing until I recognized that the spoofing actually happens at the kind of ad exchange. So they kind of uh, are bidding for ads and telling this customer there's something coming from that IP. That's, I believe, how it kind of works. So there is no IP spoofing really involved there. It's just that the people who are trying to get eyeballs or whatever are requesting stuff into these ad brokers with IP addresses from, I mean, given that the iCloud private relay ranges are public, all of the kind of uh, Apple kind of tells you what they are. Uh, of course you can use them to do that, but it's really, <laughs> I think kind of next level uh, ad specific stuff and really only relevant to ad networks, so I'm, I guess until, unless you're in the ad business, it's not very relevant. It shows, however, that the overall traffic, uh, or at least from iCloud Private Relay, still is considerably low. Yes. Well, yeah, that, that's uh, yeah. So that's why I put it in because it's the first thing that I've seen. And uh, well, I guess given uh, Akamai is uh, directly involved, you may have picked up other stuff. I hadn't. I haven't seen anything published. Uh, thus far, that's talked about the 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 the, the level of uh, private relay traffic or the sort of the, the percentage of the base that's using it. So obviously, it caught my eye seeing about the twenty percent of Safari, Safari traffic supposedly using private relay. But then the suggestion that actually, when you unpack it and, and get rid of the sort so of the, the, the the fraudulent traffic, if if you will, um, it's more like two percent um of uh, safari traffic which obviously is yeah. as you say pretty low take up if if the latter figure is, is accurate um yeah. but i don't know if anyone else has seen any 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 publicly available data that uh, uh that, that talks to the level of take up of private relay um at all not that no. i'm aware of um it's, it's also i mean uh a lot of carriers and even the mobile space are still um, turning it off because I mean I'm I mean for me the same I'm I, I have it when I'm sort of at home and have enabled it but my mobile carrier said nope uh, you can't use it because they are doing zero rating which of course is a problem with private relay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, it'd be interesting to see how many uh, carriers are disabling it, because um, um, I guess it's a year now since 
since it's been sort of talked about uh, uh, at least so uh, um, it's it's not new uh, anymore is it still technically in beta um, or because um, I think when it was launched it was positioned as being in in, in beta or even though it's obviously a key feature of uh, iOS um, or, or, uh, and there was some suggestion that yeah. yeah it's still in beta i just looked at my phone it still says beta okay oh, that's interesting to uh know i was as i was saying that i was doubting myself because it's been quite a while but <laughs> uh, but uh yeah well okay um all right well yeah maybe there'll be more stats coming out uh, yeah, over time uh, around the level of uh so usage of private really and or sort of level of uh, of blocking of, of, of private relay um, uh, that might be dampening down the uh, take up. It'd certainly be interesting to see that. Maybe that's a discussion with our good friends at AP Nick, um, if that's something that they could uh, take a look at. Um, uh, then just moving down the list. Uh, um, on some of the others, uh, yeah, there's a, sort of a short article talking about um, why we need uh, sort of better policies, uh, and it did. If you look at the text, uh, sort of reference a number of DNS-related uh, initiatives, including um, DNS for EU, in a sort of reasonably short blog post, which goes on to highlight the importance of research uh, and, and evidence in this, and and so it goes on to reference the uh, DNS Research Federation, which. Uh, um, you may recall, uh, I mentioned on this call previously, Emily Taylor and colleagues um, uh, are involved with, and uh, uh, Emily is going to come on the call in, Oct I think it's the 10th of October, if I remember rightly, to uh, just give a presentation on what the DNS Research Federation is um, and, uh, and what its aims are, just to give you a sort of general context for that but in the meantime you'll get uh, the gist of some of it from from the from this blog post if that's of interest um moving on um uh, uh, oh, again there's been sort of various comments about well, what's uh, how much overhead um dnssec validation um imposes um uh, on servers um and rather helpfully uh peta uh, gave a presentation i think it was at oarc um uh, a couple of weeks back in in philadelphia um, this is just a, a, a blog post uh to uh to complement the uh, presentation which is uh, uh on uh, the ap nick um, blog site um just giving you know the commentary to go with the slides um and just uh, you'll see i'll put it in, in the uh, narrative there's if you like the, uh, the 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 key point is actually the so the, the overhead on servers in, on most aspects is negligible um the the the, the only noteworthy uh, impact and it's not huge really is mem memory consumption um from from the tests that they've done uh, to cz uh, uh, increases by around 10 percent um, the other measures, such as server latency, bandwidth loose usage, um, CPU time, uh, and, and there are some other metrics, um, were all much the same. Um, so sort of largely unchanged. So it was really only uh, memory consumption where, where there was a, a notable increase. Um, so uh, I'm sure if Petter were on the call, he would say, uh, yeah, so there, no reason not to implement um because uh, uh, he, he's not on the call purely because uh, he's, he's gone off on uh, paternity leave so uh, won't be around for a little while um otherwise I'd, I'd i'd invite him to come on the call and i see john rather helpfully thank you john has posted a link i presume that's to the uh, presentation yeah yeah thanks and then another while not public data point i mean we are doing dnssec testing also we haven't kind of published public uh, published anything about it but the numbers he's seeing are in line with what we are seeing with our servers so i think it's doesn't matter if you use power dns bind or the akamai cacher it's all in the same realm because what really saves you is caching yeah 
Yeah, and I think that's one of the points in in, in the article that you know, the, the the cash is is incredibly helpful in this regard. Um, so yeah, for for most things, it's uh, yeah yeah you, 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 it's almost free <laughs> um, once you've implemented it, which is the important part. <laughs> um, so uh, yes, another reason to uh, go 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 and uh, in, enable um, DNSSEC uh, if, if if you've not already done so. Uh, moving down the list, uh, Akamai um, uh, just posted the uh, sort of Q2 uh, uh, insights into uh, uh, DNS covering a range of different things. Um, uh, all I really say is worth looking at. Guess, uh, click on the link, read it. It's pretty self-explanatory, um, and there's a lot of good data in there. Um, so uh, yeah, definitely a good use of time to uh, just take a look at that. And uh, yeah, it's pr pretty comprehensive, as it always is every quarter. Um, so uh, well, well worth a look. Um, uh, and, and then just scrolling down the, the last couple as you'll see on the screen um there's a small piece by mozilla just uh, underlining why it's important for there to be a uh, uh, federal privacy policy uh, federal privacy legislation even in the us um, because it's uh, something which is uh, sort of sadly lacking um no gdpr GDPR or privacy equivalent uh, in the states, as I'm sure you all know, apart from at state level in I think about three states, but um, it's certainly not consistent uh, across. Well, not, it's non-existent across the vast majority of states, and even in the few that have implemented, I think there are differences um, at state level. I think between, for example, uh, California. Is it California, New York, and Washington? I think all have different variants. Um, some of the US participants may wish to comment, but uh, any, anyway, as I say, um, as they're making the case, it, it should be uh, a federal um, legislation. Um, uh, and then finally, um, a, yeah, another article um, uh, on uh, DNS abuse, um, uh, this time uh, again from, from the uh, APNIC uh, blog. Um, just uh, um, promoting a, a, another uh, initiative in that general space, of which there are a few, um, but I think it's, it's always worth catching up on those just to see what activities are, are underway. Uh, and those are all the things that sort of caught my eye over the last um, week. I don't know if there's anything else that anyone else has picked up on um, uh, or that's currently in your mind that you, you think is worth uh, mentioning. So I'll stop talking for a moment and see if there is. Yeah, yeah, so yeah jump, I'll jump fire away. Lower my hand. So there was an interesting paper published last week, not directly related to DNS, but it was the it was about um, destinations of malware. In other words, where is malware hosted? Um, I'm interested to see the follow on for that, which is where is the DNS for malware hosted? Um, because those are tightly coupled uh, in many cases. Um, and of course, being a DNS malware service, um, we're, we're intensely interested in that. So I'm wondering if anybody else, I'm wondering if actually there has been a paper in the recent year or two on that, that anyone knows about, um, is, is anyone aware of research for DNS malware hosting? Anyone? I'll take that as a no. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but that would be an interesting topic. Mm. Was that the paper? Um, you, you've reminded me, John, actually, and I did see one which I thought was really interesting, which, which I've forgotten about, but, you know, um, uh, reminded me, um, which sort of talked about the um, ASs, the misinformation came through. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm no. sorry. It was not malware. You're right. It was it was misinformation. My apologies. It was not a malware uh, document. It's an irony. It was misinformation. It's misinformation. An irony on that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm I'm spreading misinformation already. But no, I just I just don't uh, I don't uh, I'm interested in where the DNS components of that are, and that's that's something that we actually have insight into um, to some degree. But I would be interested in a more formal sort of a non-biased paper on it if anybody's got some references recent recently. I know there was a paper. I want to say four or five years ago on it, but I haven't seen anything recently. Yeah. Um, well, you've seen a question from Kurt 
in, in the chat, John. I don't know if you've got a. a uh, yeah, I guess I guess my question is where does it? Why should it matter where DNS? Um, well, I'm really asking about where does where are the who are the hosting providers for malicious domains, meaning domains that are hosting phishing, malware, etc. Um, why should it matter? Um, boy, there's a lot wrapped up in that question. Um, like, why should it matter where? And who pays for what kind of bad things to happen on the internet? I think it's actually a fairly important question because it allows you to apply commercial pressure to prevent things from happening. Or from an operational perspective, it allows you to identify sources of bad uh, stuff, whether that's hosting or content or whatever, um, when you actually are applying filters for your own local network, if you're if you're a company that does that kind of thing or, or an organization that is interested in where bad things emanate, right? Maybe you choose to not do business with somebody who's got a lot of um, DNS malware hosted on their sites, just like you wouldn't want to put your email domain on someone who hosts a lot of spam domains either, because that's going to affect your performance. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know if anyone else has a view on that at all. Your chance to come on if you do. Um, and just while you're thinking, I did see uh, from, from from that article, well, from the paper, it was a uh, it was a academic paper paper, I think, rather than an article. Um, certainly, the work that I saw um, from memory, I think it was yeah, Cloudflare was sort of top of the league table, if that's the right way of phrasing it, with around a third of the of the uh, sort of misinformation sites rooting through it in some way um and then i can't remember exactly who was next i think there were references to people like godaddy and fastly and, and and others but they were as cloudflare was around a third something like 36 percent i think the next highest was about six percent um of uh, of the traffic um so there there was an order of magnitude difference between them um but uh the the, the paper would certainly be worth uh reading which is that the paper you've linked to there john yeah um, it is yeah perfect thank you um yeah certainly worth taking a look at um if that's a sort of subject of of interest uh to you um Perhaps we, we'll, we'll revisit that next week if Phil had a chance to have a look at it um, and then have opinions pro or against the uh, um, s some of the uh, uh, conclusions drawn um, from it. Yeah, I see, and Suzanne's helpfully posted a link to the, uh, the DNS Abuse Institute as well um, with regards to uh, domain names. Um, yeah, uh, well, well prompted. I'd forgotten. Uh, I'd passed through my uh, social media, I think, middle of last week. Um, yeah, quite a thoughtful uh, paper. Thanks, John. Um, and, and, well, what, actually, while you're there, John, um, dare I ask um, any, any, anything current on, uh, uh, on, on, on progress in the uh, German legal Lawsuit. system? or? Um, actually, yes, um, and we'll be posting a blog about that this week. Um, so uh, we're basically going to be moving into main proceedings, um, and we have actually moved into main proceedings with a filing. Um, main proceedings in Germany are um, uh, essentially it's the same set of arguments we used in our first appeal, but we get to expand the number of um, um, expert witnesses and data that we include with the legal lawsuit, or the uh, sorry, opposed to the lawsuit. So um, that's where we stand. There is no date set yet for a hearing, but um, the next phase has been entered, which is main proceeding. Um, we are still continuing actually to pursue an objection to the first ruling. Um, so uh, those of you who are familiar with German law, as I am not, uh, this is, the, it's, it's a very complicated thing, almost as bad as American law. Um, yeah. But, um, but we're, we are proceeding a, a pace. Um, well, we're as fast as we can, at least yeah. given, given the, the pace of summer and the court systems. So, um, uh, there'll be a blog post coming out shortly, though, on our site um, with with more details on that. Oh, fantastic! Well, I'm sure there'll be many people watching that with uh, a great deal of interest to see yep. how, how it develops. Yep. Um, anyone else with uh, anything current um, from this week, or anything else on your minds uh, before I move on? Chance to come in if you uh, if you wish.
not seeing anyone unmuting currently. Uh, I'm interested to hear if anybody has any plans for opportunistic uh, DOT, given the presentation by Google at DNS OARC about, um, they said, I think 6.7% of their traffic they said was opportunistic DOT, which I still find to be an amazingly large number, right. um, given the few number, the few uh, authoritatives that support it. Um, but I'm wondering if anyone has started to pursue plans or is even interested in that um, as an opportunistic model, given this, the normal silence on operational issues from a lot of the participants in the call. I don't expect a yes, but maybe, maybe someone will smile. <laughs> or say that there's something they're thinking about, but um, it is an interesting concept that that much of the traffic can be encrypted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it might take from the deep pipe. Sorry, Kathleen, go, go ahead. Sorry, oh. Kathleen, go, go ahead. Yeah, sure, I was just gonna answer his question. So I actually have seen a vendor proposal um, at the service provider level for opportunistic HTTP CPS. Um, I don't think I'll have to go back and look at the proposal. I don't know if it was DOT as well because there is DNS in this particular service. So I was surprised to see at least that in the, the service. It's a small service provider, but it would be a very large service offered. Um, I'll go back and confirm that, but um, I was surprised to see that that at least. And that's that's to authoritative servers. And that's that's to authoritative servers. I'm going to confirm. Um, I'll confirm, and then next week I'll I'll be able to speak to it. Hmm. Well, that, that will be interesting, given that they're on the deprived mailing list. They seem to be largely apathetic, uh, sort of, in terms of the, the degree of interest from the author, authoritative operators. Um, at least that was my impression when this was sort of doing the rounds six months or so ago but uh well maybe, maybe that will change uh, brian did you want to come in on that yeah so i'm um, and i can't give specifics but i'm working with a very large authoritative provider who um are looking to completely change their software um and one of the requirements they have is that it supports dot and doh on the authoritative servers for no reason other than we think that will be useful in the future. Um, so yeah, it's it's coming in the pipeline, but you know what development processes are like, they take time. Hmm. Yeah. Good. So, uh, well, I, there you go. That's a good question, John. <laughs> uh, more interest than I would have predicted, to be fair. Um, fantastic. Well, th thanks for, for that question. Um, I'll just see if anyone else wants to come in with any other topic. Otherwise, I will uh, move on. Nope. Okay, let me, uh, let me in that case move on. I will reshare my screen just because it's probably easier for you to follow if I do that. Um, so just a reminder, um, put on the screen sort of events coming up through the rest of this calendar year um, that, that, that I'm aware of, just uh, so you, you've got those um, to hand. Um, just a reminder again, I know we touched on this last week um, as the main topic of the call, but uh, you, th there's that cluster uh, you'll see um, starting with, um, where are we? Um, the IAB Management Techniques Workshop, so Management Techniques in Encrypted Networks Workshop, uh, the virtual one, um, 17th to 21st October, which then follows directly into uh, OWOC 39 in Belgrade, then a potential in-person IAB workshop uh, segment um, uh, also uh, in Belgrade on the 24th uh, to run um, sort of in parallel with the uh, RIPE 85 event in Belgrade. Um, and as you may recall from last week, the OARC 39 um, is being convened sort of jointly with, uh, I think there's a centre technical workshop um, uh, co-located with uh, OARC, uh, the, the, the centre element sort of is, is the first 
I think possibly half day or so, um, and then that segues neatly into OOC 39 for the remainder of the two days. And then uh, I gather it's about 10 minutes or so down the road in Belgrade uh, is the location for um, OOC, which starts the day after. Um, so the location for RIPE 85 rather, which starts the uh, day after OARC um, finishes. So uh, you get sort of value for money from travelling to Belgrade if you're sort of contemplating doing so. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff um, to either side of that. Um, probably the other thing worth mentioning is ITF uh, 115 in, in London. If you haven't spotted it um, uh, already, the, it, you, it's now open for registrations. Um, so the early bird in-person registration rate, as always, is $700. Um, and that will, that will remain open for a few weeks yet before it ticks up to the uh, standard rate, uh, which I think is 875 um, and similar savings for the uh, remote uh, attendance rates. Um, when I checked um, yesterday, I think there's a hundred or so people had already registered for in-person attendance. Um, and the hotel rate, um, the sort of discounted rate uh, available through uh, the ITF link is, is pretty substantial. It's about a third off the uh, sort of the, the, the rate available through the uh, hotel loyalty scheme. Um, um, so it's uh, I think it was just over two hundred pounds per night, including breakfast. Um, so uh, an improvement on uh, Philadelphia that the uh, uh, the daily rate does include breakfast this time, um, which I think is a bonus. Um, so if you're, if you're planning on going, uh, if you register soon, then uh, say you, you you get the, uh, uh, the the early bird rate. Um, yeah, uh, and then sort of final reminder just at the bottom, uh, you'll see uh, uh, going back to OAC oh, thirty nine um, call for presentations uh, is still open um, um, for the next uh, week. I think that uh, closes next Tuesday. Um, so if you have any ideas for a presentation for OAC 39, um, you can sort of use that link to uh, submit your ideas through to the for consideration by the uh, uh, program committee. Um, the feedback I've had from the team already is that there's there's a pretty healthy level of uh, material submitted. Um, so hopefully it should be an interesting program that that uh, comes together. But uh, still time to put some ideas in if you've not already done, uh, done so. Um, uh, and then finally for me, just a few quick reminders uh, over the next few weeks. Uh, next week, um, we're going to, uh, again, we keep it fairly informal, but we have a focus uh, over to the discussion around encrypted client hello in particular. Um, so uh, um, a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit, we just sort of tease out what uh, people's current thinking is um, on uh, ECH. There's been a sort of few discussions I'm aware of happening on that, so we, we thought uh, that'd be a, a useful discussion. Um, I'm not sure that there'll be so many people joining from the US next week, as, as we discussed before the call started, because it does coincide with Labor Day. But uh, obviously, anyone is very welcome to join if uh, if you have some time uh, during the day. And clearly, for the rest of us from the rest of the world, uh, um, we, we, we'll carry on and, and the discussion will be available for uh, replay later. Um, uh, following Monday, we should be having that the that panel discussion. I hope to nail that down um, today or tomorrow. I'm just waiting um, for for confirmation from uh, for, for, from Joe Crow at Comcast that he's he's gone through and got sign off from his internal processes for that. As soon as I have that, I'll put a note out just to confirm. Um, um, so, sort of given the level of interest after the last panel discussion we did with. Uh, uh, quad nine and others. Um, I think that might be well worth uh, attending. Um, and then you, you'll see later on in September, we're, we're going to talk about the impact of encrypted DNS on internet filtering. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier in the call this week, uh, on 10th of October, uh, Emily Taylor from Oxford Information Labs will be joining us to talk about the DNS Research Federation. Um, and there are a few other things I'll be adding to the uh, the, the schedule um, again over the next week or so. So you see if your things drop into there. Um, and just a reminder, if anyone has anything that you particularly would like either to discuss or to, to hear about, uh, do drop me a line. Um, 
uh, separately and uh, we'll see what we can do to um, add that in um right so we are definitely now at any other business so does if i stop sharing again um does anyone have anything else you want to come back in on or well, any questions on any of that or indeed anything else um that you think is worth just highlighting and if you do either just so sort of unmute or indeed just pop it in the chat whichever is easier for you I don't think anyone's typing because it's not telling me that they are. And I'm not seeing anyone unmuting. Nope. In which case, I think we'll um, uh, wrap it up there then. So uh, thank you, uh, uh, everyone, for joining this week. Thanks for your time. Hope that was uh, useful. Have a fantastic uh, week and uh, as always we'll, we'll catch up uh, um, same time next week so hope to see you all uh, on the call then have a great week thanks andrew thanks. Bye.